Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Eden Foods, the most trusted name in certified organic clean food. When you shop online at EdenFoods.com, enter the coupon code ORGVIEW to receive 20% off any regularly priced items, excluding cases. For other promotional offers, please visit TheOrganicView.com's website. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about new research regarding the impact of neonicotinoids on bee sperm. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. It is a new week with new research. And unfortunately, even though this is quite compelling research, I don't think it's really going to matter for the big picture because EPA still is not budging. And while this is new research that focuses on bee sperm, the impact of neonicotinoids on the reproductive process is not a new topic at all. We've uh, we've been concerned about the effects of these neonicotinoid pesticides for a long time. And it might help the listeners to understand a little bit about what we're seeing. In a healthy colony of bees, there's an area called the brood nest, and that would cover several frames of honeycomb. And the brood would be in three stages. The first is egg, and then larva. And then that larva is fed by the nurse bees, grows very quickly over a period of about seven days, then spins a a very fine cocoon in the cell. The nurse bees cap the cell off with a breathable form of beeswax, and that's called sealed brood. So in any healthy colony of bees, you will see brood in all three stages. You will see eggs and larvae and sealed brood. One of the things that we've uh, come to see with uh, unfortunate regularity is what we call shotgun brood. The brood, the sealed brood, should be almost continuous, almost complete with very few cells that are what we would call skips. What we've been seeing over the past several years is shotgun brood where many, many of the cells are empty. And either the queen has laid an egg that wasn't viable or the, the larva died. Whatever the reason, that portion of the brood has not survived. And we've been concerned about that. And this is research that shows another possible avenue by which that sort of poisoning can take place. We're also concerned about the contamination of the incoming food sources, the pollen, which is turned into uh, royal jelly by the nurse bees. That's fed in turn to the queen exclusively that's her diet, and for the first two or three days to the larva, we're, we're concerned that that's directly contaminated and that what's called bee bread, which is the pollen mixed with a little honey, uh, which is fed to the larva in the last three days of their life, may also be contaminated. We're also concerned that the contamination may affect the fertility or the viability of the queen. One of the things that we're seeing is supersedure of the queens, replacement of the queens, without any apparent reason. And uh, we're concerned that this may be the result of neonicotinoid poisoning of the colony. Now, Tom, do you recall the interview that we did with Jeff Anderson, I don't know, a couple of years back, in which there was an issue with some new labeling verbiage. And unfortunately, there was a situation in which there was a massive bee kill. And I guess there was what's called an IGR had been applied. And the IGRs are insect growth regulators. 
Do you remember that? I do. Um, I don't specifically remember the insect growth regulator, but that's one of the new technologies that has appeared and become a player in these losses. We still think that the neonicotinoids are the major player, though, simply because of how extensively they're being used. They're the most commonly used pesticides, and they cover millions, hundreds of millions of acres. Well, the point that I was trying to make was that when this massive bee kill occurred, someone had used an IGR. And actually, there was some sort of a chemical cocktail, if I do recall. The way that these things are used is pretty much they mix it and providing that it doesn't blow up, if it gets the job done, it gets the job done. I would say about three, year, three maybe four years ago. In any event, there was a lot of controversy back then about how some of these chemicals are affecting the brood. So this, to me, is no surprise. But at the end of the day, how many studies is it going to take before EPA actually takes action and does something? Well, I don't, I don't think that the science makes any difference at all anymore. They simply ignore it. If it doesn't serve their interests, they simply ignore it. And their conduct goes unsanctioned. The management in the EPA, and I, and I want to say our concerns are primarily with the Office of Pesticide Programs. Other aspects of the EPA may be doing better, but the Office of Pesticide Programs appears to be terribly corrupted. The regulation is, is embarrassing at best, and they have become a marketing agency for the chemical companies. It's a disgrace. But there's what management there is going on at the EPA and the Office of Pesticide Programs is management that expresses the interests of the chemical companies, the very companies that the EPA is supposed to be regulating. And many of the management people in that division are former uh, chemical company employees and will probably be future chemical company employees, the proverbial revolving door, um, the highest level of management in the EPA is Congress, and nobody seems to be in the driver's seat other than the chemical companies, and this is what we're getting. And until we begin to see some changes in the management will continue to have these kinds of problems, and they will get much, much worse, I fear. Well, they've been getting worse. Mm -hmm. But this particular study, I'd like to focus on the study for a moment. This particular study was conducted by Lars Straub, who was the lead researcher at the University of Bern on this particular study. This has appeared in so many different media outlets, the one that I first saw appeared in the Associated Press, and I think they were kind of ahead of the game, which lately seems to be a little unusual, because uh, for the most part, The Guardian seems to be on top of this, you know, every step of the way, they, they seem to be two steps ahead. In any event, with this particular study, Laura Straub was quoted as saying, there's a reduction in sperm viability and the amount of living sperm, but that doesn't mean there's no living sperm at hand. The big question is, is there still enough of sperm that survived to do the job? Queens generally have one mating flight and store sperm. Now, apparently in this study, it said that both the drones that ate insecticide-treated pollen and those not exposed to the chemicals produced about the same amount of sperm. The difference was clear when the researchers put the sperm under the microscope. The bee that didn't have pesticide in its pollen produced on average 1.98 million living sperm, the one with neonicotinoids in its food about 1.2 million. So that is quite a reduction, but the bottom line is, is that these chemicals are having an effect on their reproductive abilities, their navigation. Well, we may find that the, this effect on There's, the sperm cells is transmitted through the life cycle of the bee. It may be the basis for the, in part at least, for the failure of, of navigational ability and 
failure to thrive. Uh, these things are expressing themselves in all sorts of ways, and the EPA and the USDA have chosen as best they can to simply ignore this or sidestep it. It's a disgraceful example of uh, administrative failure. What I think is baffling is when you take a look at what else is out there and you have people that are trying to say that, oh, well, it could be everything from climate change to varroa mites to this to that. And the bottom line is, is that there is so much research that's been conducted and not just research that's been paid for, research that has been independently conducted, peer-reviewed and published. And the peer review part is very important because you're talking about some of the world's top scientists that are focusing on the impact of neonicotinoids. So once again, at what point will EPA step up to the plate and actually do its job? And unfortunately, EPA influences PIMRA, which is the Canadian version of EPA. So to a certain degree, it makes you wonder, are they trying to make deals behind closed doors with industry or are they at some point actually going to do the job that they were created to do well i, like I think i think the reality is that the uh, in the pesticide uh arena the world marches to the beat of the epa they're the big boy on the block and PIMRA and Canada and many of the other regulatory agencies around the globe look to the EPA for direction. And the EPA, I'm sorry to say, at least in the pesticide arena, appears to be a complete failure. They've, they've taken us into what may be, for the lower level life forms, may be the most disastrous environmental poisoning we have ever ever seen. And they're doing everything they can to spin the story away from that. Because what, as that story be, is revealed, it's clear that they've been complicit in the decisions that have led us to this disaster. They're doing the best they can to cover it up. So don't expect much from the EPA unless the people apply enormous pressure not only to those agencies, but to their federal representatives. Nobody is doing anything here. Well, Tom, each week we talk about this, and to a certain degree, you and I both have hope that they will. But in any event, we do have people that are tuning in, that are listening to the scientists, and are understanding basically what's going on and what is at stake. So, unfortunately, I don't see any type of solution in the near future, but hopefully at some point EPA will come around. But in the interim, we have to keep continuing with our discussions because we receive so many emails, so many messages on social media. And, folks, if you have a question for me or for Tom, please write to us at questions at theorganicview.com. Well, Tom, thanks again for joining me today. I Really hope that this does send a message to the powers that be and, and somebody actually does take action. It is an election year and food security really is at stake and that's not even an issue being discussed by either candidate. I have to say with uh, all the problems that we're facing, I'm encouraged by the rising public voice and that's what it's going to take. The public is going to have to take it upon themselves to manage this, this situation. Otherwise, it won't be managed in their best interests. They need to speak out, and they're doing so in greater and greater numbers every day. So that's encouraging. So uh, I want to thank our listeners for paying attention. As June says, we've talked about this uh perhaps ad nauseum for some of you, for several years now, and we're trying to do our best. We're not talking heads. We're not paid for this. We believe this; these are important issues, and, uh, and I thank June, and I thank all of the listeners for tuning in and paying attention. And, folks, also I want to point out that Tom does write a weekly column called Tom's Corner, which is part of Boulder County Beekeepers Association. There is a link at theorganicview.com forward slash neonicotinoids where actually there's a bunch of information 
about neonicotinoids as well as a lot of really important interviews included. So please check that out. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue the discussion. Have a great day, folks.